Hey, thanks for tuning into the Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Ev. And um, let me start this way today. We all have people in our lives that we have admired, we've mentored after them. Uh, we can call them our heroes at different levels. And we wonder if one day we're going to run into somebody in a chance encounter on the street. And what will we do? Well, most people take selfies. If it was me, because my guess is one or three people that I would love to run into on the street. I have lots of questions. So I don't have to wait for a chance encounter. Let me tell you who my guest is. Ultra successful people who you would assume don't need a coach are the ones who call Rich Litvin. His clients have included Olympic athletes, presidential candidates, Hollywood film directors, special forces operatives, operatives serial entrepreneurs, PhD, and Harvard Business School alumni. Rich is the founder of 4PC, a community of the top 4% of coaches and leaders. A thought leader in the coaching world, Rich is co-author of the highly acclaimed book, The Prosperous Coach, which has sold over 70,000 copies uh, and appeared in the top 20 books on coaching on Amazon for seven years. He leads a community of almost 20,000 coaches and consultants. He's helped train some of the most exclusive coaches on the planet. A scientist by training, Rich has background in behaviors physiology, and psychology. He trained to teach at the University of Oxford, and he has a master's degree in educational effectiveness and improvement. His big picture is to mobilize $100 million to educate a million children. His company has helped to build five schools in Africa. Rich, with your permission, before I dive into it, I just wanted to set for my audience how I structured this, our time together. And then I'll be quiet um, because my audience is our entrepreneurs from startup founders all the way to successful multi-million dollar business owners and quite a few performance leading marketeers. And one of the things that has baffled me as a business coach for 12 years is that coaching still, despite its brilliance, has not become main, the mainstay of anybody who should really use it. And that's sort of what I want to tackle with you today. But before we get there, first step is to peel the rich Litvin onion. I want my audience to get to know you as well as I intimately know you because I've followed you for six years. Then dive into coaching, uh, talk about what performance is, what is affected coaching, and maybe end with your advice to anyone who hopefully after our session today will actually consider coaching. So is that okay, Rich? Or can we play? Uh, Zev, that's great. Shalom. It's great to see you. Um, I am glad we met this way and not on the street because I'm more of an introvert. I'm not shy, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I like to, to be at home. So this is this is my wheelhouse, have, having fascinating conversations, much more fun than talking to a stranger on the street. Perfect. So I'm going to start the way you start. Rich, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. Give me a time frame. What do I have? 60 seconds? Uh a minute, minute and a half, because I got a lot of stuff. I don't want you to reveal too exactly. much. <laughs> okay, that's what I need. Um, okay, born in London. Um, uh, I had a dad who, his way of showing love to me was to constantly challenge me. So when I'd share something I was successful at, he'd find the thing that I hadn't done to say, well, you missed this, or you didn't do that, which came from love, but as a little kid, confused me and made me push to get more and more and more. And so I've been a high performer my whole life, always focused on success, always focused on achievement. For most of my life, not from a healthy healthy space, trying to prove myself first to my father and then to other people. Uh, I left university having no idea what I wanted to do, just knowing I wanted to work with people. Went to the work in a, a hospital in London, a children's hospital uh, in human resources. Hated it because it was all about administration and not about people went to a talk, no, went to a, a careers fair to enroll people to work at the hospital. And I was so bored, I snuck off and found a talk in the background about teaching. And I thought, this sounds fascinating. And then spent the next 15 years as a teacher, trained at Oxford University, 15 years as an educator. I loved it. I taught in Africa. I taught in Southeast Asia. I taught in London. I love kids. Um, I didn't love teaching. I loved kids. I didn't love my subject, I should say. I was a science scientist by background. And what I discovered as I became more senior and less people observed my lessons, 
I'd sit down with the kids and say, hey, what's going on? Tell me your story. How's life? What are you up to? And they loved coming to my classes. And then they started harder for me than they did for the teachers who were trying to push the curriculum down their throat. I'm a people person that always have been. In 2005, I went to a new school. I was an assistant principal. We were going to change the world of education. The new boss had just hired me. And then suddenly, two weeks later, he was fired. And then I was fired a week later by the new boss who came to work, uh, came to the school. And I went to a beach in Thailand to lick my wounds. And I began coaching on that beach because I've been trained in coaching for the previous couple of years as an educator. Uh, and for the last 17, 18 years now, that's been my career. I used to call myself an accidental entrepreneur. And I realized, actually, I've been an entrepreneur and a coach for longer than I was a, a teacher. 18 years now, um, I get paid a lot of money to mess with people's thinking. Perfect. Um, so interestingly, you know, I've been a coach for 12 years, not at all at the caliber of coaches that you work with. But um, I think that the one criteria that turns anyone who wants to be a coach, which is so easy to do, into an effective coach is what you do so well. And that's the empathy, the ability to read people from a, from a human perspective, right? You don't walk into a coaching session because you're successful and you know it all. You walk into a coaching section with humility and you just listen and you have that, that intrinsic ability to just hone in on what we in marketing, we call the pain point, but it could be anything. And so, and I don't think you can teach that. I think it comes from who you are. And here's a quote from you. When I was young, I knew I was different. I just didn't know it was okay to be different, right? True. So yeah. can, you, can you go back to, to whatever point in time where this realization kind of hits you? Do you remember how it felt and how you dealt with it? Uh, no, because I didn't know that, you know, that realization came a lot later in my life. I went through my entire childhood and uh, not understanding what it meant to be different, thinking that I was uh, somehow strange. I, I, when I was in my early twenties uh, and dating, my buddies and I in London would go to bars and nightclubs because back then was the place that you meant to meet girls or women. And I never understood. I, I, I didn't like it. I, I just thought I was shy. I didn't know that being an introvert is not about being shy. It's about how you get your energy. And I get drained being around a lot of people. I didn't realize back then I was very sensitive to sounds and lights and being in a nightclub was a bit overwhelming for me. So it took a long time for me to understand uh, who I am in the world. I'm still on that journey, understanding myself. But as I have had compassion with myself on that journey, I understand, I began to understand other people. So back, back to your phrase around coaching, uh, your idea around co coaching, I think it can be taught and there are different types of coaches. There are informational coaches who want to tell you, this is the way it's done. Do it, do this way. And there's that's value in that sometimes. Uh, a bit more mentoring than coaching, but an informational coach will give the information that you need. There are motivational coaches. Uh, sports coaches often, like the, the rah-rah, the less, you can do it, son. You got this. Come on. There's a place for that. I'm a transformational coach. So I play in a different way and it can be taught. Got it. And, and you laid it out perfectly because, and again, there's, there's room for everyone. Um, uh, it, it's really, and, and we'll get to this later on is, is in terms of the person who's looking for a transformation, do they even know, do they even know what that is? Or they even, or they're aware that they're looking, that they need it. But I want to get to that in a second. So what I wanted to do, Rich, is, you always say that coaching used to be called leadership, right? That coaching is about leadership. And I wanted to maybe just water it down to simplicity because I love simplicity. Me too. How, do we how do we define leader or leadership? <clears throat> um, so I don't quote Margaret Thatcher very often, uh, but I do love this quote from Margaret Thatcher, uh, former British prime minister. Uh, Margaret Thatcher says, said, being a leader is like being a lady. If you have to tell people you're one, you're probably not. And I think that catches the heart of leadership. There are people we all know in every field we've ever been in who have the title of leader, and no one's actually really following unless it's by coercion. And there are other people who have no title, 
and everyone's following. So I think the true test of leadership is turn around. If people are following, you're a leader. And if no one's following, I don't care what title you have, you're not a leader. That's the simplicity of leadership for me. But if I'm, and I'm surrounded by entrepreneurs and business, and I worked in the corporate world for 30 years, and that's where people with titles, whether it's president, CEO, VP, you know, it's it comes with authoritative figure, but they're not leaders, but people feel that they they have to follow because they have to follow. Otherwise, you get fired. You do what you're told, you know, the typical industrial age yep. psychology. Um so how do I know if I, I can look back and I can see people behind me, especially in, in the corporate environment, but I don't know if they're really following because I'm a leader or they're following by, you say, like by coercions. What are the signals that might tell me that I'm actually on the right track as a leader? Well, let me ask why you're asking that question, because uh, that, that, uh, uh, that question per se interests me less. I don't work with the kind of leader, let me put it this way, the kind of leader who's leading by uh, uh, coerced, coercion and authoritarian ways isn't gonna be sitting down with me to say, well, what do you think about my leadership, Rich? Yeah. They wouldn't have that question in their mind. So that's not, that's not an issue I ever had to deal with. So it's a question that doesn't quite compute for me. Yeah, and I asked it on purpose because of my audience, because it's very typical for entrepreneurs and small, small business owners who make the majority of, of, of ownership in the US uh, and, and the people that I work with, I would say just because you have a CEO title or you own something does not give you a free pass at leadership or managing people. You have to earn the right to do it. You, okay, mm -hmm. so, you're the, so you're the boss, even I, I hate that word, fine. Yeah. But people can come to work every day and just not care about you because they need a job. The difference mm -hmm. between a leader and someone that, that we just described is the person that that has the empathy, the, the awareness. Well, look, look, again, this is the test. You know, are, are people following the classic example of leadership like that is I have an open door policy. Anyone can come and speak to me. And then when you go and check in with a leader, well, no one's come to speak to me. Everything must be fine. No, you don't really have an open door policy. You just have a door that is open. Uh, what, what's, what's the mission of the company? Well, look at that big glass framed, beautifully engraved uh, description of the company's mission that's on the wall by the front door. No, that's not the mission. That's a beautifully inscribed frame with an Im image on it. The mission is what's actually happening in the company. Most leaders are not reflective. And I think that's, that's a real key to leadership. Self-awareness is a huge, important part of leadership that most leaders miss. So if they're listening to your podcast, they're already self-aware. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's a, uh, and again, I'm just sharing my opinion and please correct me. I think it's a two-step process. It's having the awareness is the first step. And the second step is, so what are you going to do about it? Right? So mm -hmm. just being aware isn't enough. It might, it might be a feel-good perception, or oh, I'm aware, but if you're not acting on it or being coached as, as what you do, then the awareness doesn't really go anywhere. It's really the first step, I think. Um, I'm going to quote you again because you always openly share your life and your own personal feelings. Um, you said, "I was a fearful child. I've been fear. I, I'm. I've been a fearful man, and I've spent most of my life covering it up by doing all I can to look confident on the outside. Fear is a mask for desire." And, and I thought this was a really profound statement, and I immediately thought about people that you coach, maybe that I coach, people that I know wh who suffer from this, right? It's, it's a way to mask the fear of maybe failure, maybe not knowing what to do, right? Can, can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I can. And I'm, I'm just thinking which place to come from. Look, for me, I never understood confidence. I didn't feel like I had it as a kid. I felt there were some people who were naturally confident and, and not me. And when I first started coaching 18 years ago, I spent two years on a research project. I traveled around the world interviewing what I called the world's most confident people. Who are these people who have it naturally? Because uh, I don't, and is, is how I felt. And what I discovered is confidence is a result. It's not a requirement. 
We always think we want it first. Whatever's coming next, even with all the things we've achieved in the past, whatever is up we're up to next is something bigger, something new. And now I wish I had the confidence first. And most people hold back until the confidence comes and it never does because it's a result, not a requirement, and which is why most people don't go and accomplish the big things. And even those of us who have accomplished big things, we forget each time. So it's not confidence that's needed. What is needed is courage. And one of my mentors is a man named Dan Sullivan. You might know from his company, Strategic Coach. The Dan, Dan Sullivan served, question. Uh, yep. Dan served in the military uh, in, during the Korean War. And, and one day, the, his sergeant told the young new recruits, it's time for live hand grenade practice tomorrow. And he said, who's scared? And Dan put his hand up and nobody else did. And the sergeant said, Sullivan, I trust you because everyone's scared. They're just not admitting it. And then he gave a fantastic definition. He said, look, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is peeing your pants because you're so scared and then doing what needs to be done with wet pants. I'm writing a yeah. book right now with my nine-year-old son. He's going through a lot of anxiety. He's school for, we don't quite know why, it's become a really scary place for him. And he's a brave kid. When he was three years old, I found him climbing on the kitchen counters. He's, if we go to a theme park, he wants to go on the scariest rides. But right now, he's going through a lot of anxiety. And I have spent much of the past few weeks working from the kindergarten playground. I'm home now because my wife is there with him. So I could be here on this call with you because I couldn't do this from my, my phone. Um, and we're writing a book called A Little Scary is Good. A Little Scary is Good. Because that's the game I want to teach him, not to take his fears away, but to have him every day lean a little bit into his fears. And that's the job for each of us as leaders, as entrepreneurs. It's a scary mission to be on. And each day lean a little bit into that fear because that's where courage is built. So when I say, oh, what was the phrase that you, you, you read back to me that, that I'd said in the past? Fear, fear is a mask for desire. Fear is a mask for desire. Not, not always. I'm not talking about fear of spiders or fear of heights. Yeah. But when there's something that feels scary as an entrepreneur, it's often because we want it. And that means if you're feeling afraid about something, lean into it. So I have a tool I teach my clients. I call it the what scares me list. I say, make a list, but dozen things that scare you in life, in business. And then one at a time, we look at them and see how can we turn that fear into a goal, into a mission, into something that one day they go, huh, I can now do that. Interesting, because, you know, five years ago, somebody challenged me and said, look, you're a funny guy sometimes. There's a, there's a contest in New York City of funniest Jewish comedians. You go in, hmm. you do your thing, and if you win, you get a one-year gig in the city. And I said, I'm a funny one-liner guy, but I can't prepare materials and go stand in front of people and try to be funny. It scared the crap out of me. And I read somewhere a long time ago, that if something scares you, you should just do it, you know, just dive into it. And I said, you know, because it's just like what you said, because it scares me so much and I haven't experienced it before. I'm going to do it. So for three nice. months, I, I wrote and rewrote and tore it up and tore it up. And I got to two weeks before and I had to commit and I committed. And getting on stage with heart palpitation was was one of the scariest things I've ever done. And I'm comfortable in public speaking. This was mm -hmm. scary. Can't, play, mm -hmm. can't put my point, finger, my finger on it, but it was incredibly scary with 120 people in the audience and you have to make them laugh. And it's one of these instant biofeedback, not bio, yep. but feedback that if if they're not laughing, it does something to you. I mean, how do you, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. So the first joke I had was, did anybody hear of a recall for adult diapers? Because I'm scared shitless and i'm i don't want my diaper to fail while i'm standing and that was, <laughs> anyway so that was the end so um here's something else my, my, my wife is a singer songwriter um she's won awards for her music she's a jazz singer she's in comedy school right now and she's doing a gig on friday um where she's gonna be doing stand-up comedy it's very yeah. very scary yeah I and, and actually i'm gonna end our time with a quote from your wife but we'll get to that in a second so uh -huh. something else you say for for my audience to listen because it's brilliant on the other side of success it can be very lonely the more successful you become the more you feel like an imposter and if you're the only smart person in the room you're in the wrong room successful leaders need more support than we can imagine 
And I think that's what's holding people that I come across with so much from actually embracing coaching, right? It's what you said. Successful, they, they need it more than anybody else, but maybe it's the fear of, of admitting that they need it. Well, I, I, we're in the coaching century and some of the most successful leaders on the planet have coaches and talk about it very openly. Uh, there's a book called Trillion Dollar Coach about a, a business coach in Silicon Valley who helps some of the most successful companies in Silicon Valley by coaching them. So great athletes, great performers, great entrepreneurs do understand this. We are moving more and more into this understanding of the thing that separates you from what you want next is your thinking. And you need someone on your team who can mess with your thinking. You can't do that from reading a book. You can't do that from listening to a podcast. Great coaches help great leaders. Yeah, and, and I read, a, I think you might like this a definition of this, this stuff that's going on between our ears as a mental prison. Mm -hmm. And you need somebody to, to come in with the key and open the door for you, to liberate yourself from whatever is going on. It's too complex, but we know what's going on now. The fear of failure and, and not taking risk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so as I said before, I think my personal belief is that an effective coach is someone who quickly and intuitively identifies the areas of struggle or the things that are inside the mental prison. And the second piece is that they're also, they must be able to connect on a personal intimate level with their client. Because otherwise it's one of the, one of the type of coaches you mentioned before, here's how you do things. Let me give you a template, just follow the checklist. Um, are those, again, I wanted to ask you what I just said, intuitively identifying areas, intimately connecting with people. You've done it successfully for so many years. You work with successful coaches. Are these innate skills or can you teach someone to be that? I think it's like leadership. Leadership is complex and so is parenting and so is marriage. And, and there are skills that you can learn and develop over time. Most people don't. The trouble with the corporate world is if you're good at anything, you get promoted and now you're no longer doing the thing that you're great at. You're doing this thing called leadership that no one ever trained you for. You know, my first ever leadership role was at 11 years old. They told me I, in my elementary school in England, your school captain, the head teacher told me you're the school captain. I got a little pin to wear on my, my, my shirt. I didn't know what this meant. I thought it was an honor, but I didn't know what, what it meant. And a day later, when some kids were misbehaving, I went and told the head teacher because I thought, that's what leadership is, right? I better go and tell her now I'm a leader. And then all the kids hated me and I realized, oh, maybe that isn't leadership. I have had leader th leadership thrust upon me in all sorts of situations. And I've, I've, I've risen to the occasion at times and I've screwed up at times. I learned a lot about leadership from watching some very poor leaders over the years. Probably learned more about that by saying, okay, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that than, than the stuff I read in books about what you're supposed to do. So some of it is intuitive and leadership can be taught. Coaching can be taught. These are empathy can be taught. So these are all skills that can really be mm -hmm. taught. So I mean, I've listened. I listen to you regularly, and I watch everything you've done. And and you do have that innate intuitive ability to listen, and very quickly hone in. On well, I've got to, I've got to catch you on your wording because you you use the word innate again, and I'm saying no, it's not innate. I wasn't innate. I didn't oh. know this at the beginning. I didn't think this way. You know, uh, I, I, my attention was more on me in the beginning of my life because mm -hmm. I was so terrified of what everyone would think of me. And so I've learned these skills over time. Coaching is an apprentice-based profession. So I am always, 18 years after I began this career, I'm still studying and learning. I have mentors, I have teachers. I've got five different coaches right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've got a parenting coach because I'm struggling with parenting. I've got a therapist, that, a couples therapist my wife and I work with. I've got two business mentors and I've got someone who's mentoring me about intuition because it's something I want to study more on it right now. Right. I never stop learning and growing. That's the key to leadership, key to being a great coach. So I want to ask you a question. So sort of a left field about intuition. You proposed to Monique after 10 days. Mm -hmm. There was something there that just, you said, this is the person for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you remember what it was? Or is this too, too personal? No, you can ask me any question. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll let you know if it's too personal. Not at all. Um, I, I think I, so I had left England and spent six months living in Thailand 
I went there to lick my wounds from being fired and never been fired before, but I had such an amazing time. I decided, oh, if I rent my house out, I can stay in Thailand for longer. So I rented my house out, freaked out all my family and friends, and I stayed in Thailand for six months. Then the rainy season came and I didn't want to stay there through the rain. So I found a course around coaching in the US, came over here. The course was so awful. I quit after two days and I met Monique at a workshop around relationships. And so some people joke, well, that was a great workshop, right? It worked. Look, I think, I think sometimes you're not meant to live in the place where you were born. And I think sometimes you're constrained by the thought of this is who I am. And, and I love Zoom for this because the, the, this looks like my world. These boundaries above me to the left and right of me if you're, if you're listening on the podcast I'm, I'm moving my hands right now to to show you know the the, the uh, on the video where the limits of my camera are but of course there's a whole world either side of this that that you can't see right now and and most of the time that's where we are we have these blinkers on and so by being out of my normal environment by taking risks in my life i took another risk we sometimes laugh monique and i why didn't we just say let's date for a while I don't know. I mean, I, I, I did something that was crazy. I'm not, say, I'm not saying that's the solution to always do things that are crazy. We have had ups and downs in this relationship over time. The relationships I found are really challenging. I don't have many role models for having a great relationship. But I think sometimes trusting our heart, trusting our inner wisdom is a path worth following. Yeah, interesting. Because, I mean, I think it was Blink that talked about intuition, the book Blink, and it was... And it was really the combination of life experiences uh, where your brain does the, the AI processing quickly and it winds up as an intuitive feeling or decision that you make. There's another concept that, that's very common to what you do other than coaching, and that's the word performance. And, and, and it's, again, a word that we use a lot and in some areas of performance in sales, it's a tangible goal. You can measure it. How do you measure other aspects of performance? So how do we define performance in areas where they're intangible? Nice. So what fascinates me, and I've been studying for over a decade, is what I call the other side of success. Mm -hmm. I, I know how to help people become successful, um, I, and I've been successful myself in all sorts of ways. But what's interesting is so everyone thinks that success is a place to get to. And finally, I can put my feet up, drink cocktails all day, sitting on a beach. I have not yet met a successful person who has said, great, here I am, let's stop. When you're an entrepreneur, it is in your blood. You can't stop. In fact, the most common result after selling your business for eight, nine, 10 figures is depression. Most people don't realize mm -hmm. this. So, I'm really fascinated by how do you continue on this journey for, of success? And David Brooks teaches a very interesting concept. He calls, it's the difference between what he calls resume goals and eulogy goals. And we've spent our whole life being trained to think about our resume. What's on our CV? What are we going to share with other people, our accomplishments? You go to a dinner party. What are you up to? And we talk about our accomplishments. But eulogy goals, what do our kids say about us? What will be said about us when we're gone? Um, you know, no matter how much money you make, you're all going out of this planet the same way. You can't take it with you. So what really counts? And that really interests me. I work with people around what's the difference that you really want to be known for? Because I promise you when you're gone, your obituary is not going to say how much money is in your bank account because nobody cares. It's brilliant. I took a Zig Ziglar leadership course many years ago. Mm. And the first exercise we had to do was actually read our re the retirement speech, what people would say about us in retirement. And it was pretty profound because you, you have, it's sort of like the Dan Sullivan question, you know, fast forward three years, think about what the future looks like. This is like fast forward to the end of your career. What do you want to be known for? What kind of, what are you leaving behind? Uh, well, Zev, if you want to take it to the next level, this is, this is, could be emotional for some people, but uh, there's an exercise where you write your own obituary. And, and there's two ways to do that. One is write it now. If, if this was your last day on earth, what would people be saying about you tomorrow? And then write another version about it, uh, another version of it. If you lived for another 50 years and you got to accomplish all the things that made a meaningful difference in the world that you really wanted, the obituary you'd love people to say about you. 
And then you use that one to create your life. Each day you wake up and you read that and you say, okay, how am I on that mission today? Yeah, it's amazing. And, and I used to tell my MBA students something, another statistic that the, the number one question or the number one thing that people in nursing homes, when you talk to them and you said, what do you want to talk about? It's what they regret not being able to have accomplished in their lives. This is like you're on a one-way ticket. You're, you're going out. And yeah. said, look, you have an opportunity now to fast forward. You know, it's like what you said, right? Have no regrets at, at whatever point you get to and work mm -hmm. on it today. So um, so going back to, I, I, I do feel that coaching, as brilliant as it is and the value you provide, is still, it baffles me that has not become mainstream. I know, I know you said this is the era of coaching, but in, in the universe of small business owners and entrepreneurs, in companies that are, let's say, from three to ten, twelve million dollars, uh, so many of them have that resistance. Um, how do you? How do we? How does somebody get to the awareness that they need to be coached? What are the symptoms? Well, it, I, I, again, at the risk of being provocative, I'm less yeah. interested in the answer to that question because I'm not trying to help everyone have a coach. What I'd be interested in is the people who are listening to your podcast right now, how many of them already have a coach? If they don't have a coach, well, they're clearly learners. That's why they're here. You don't listen to a podcast like this. You go and watch TV if, if you're not interested in learning. And so, you know, what, what, what do they need most? What's missing from their life? And so for those particular leaders and entrepreneurs who are on your podcast, rather than how do we help everyone get a coach, is, is what's, what do they need most? And how can they be supported? And that, that's an interesting question for you, to, if you're listening right now, to reflect on. Uh, you know, who's, who's guiding me? Who's mentoring me? Who, who's, who's a, a trusted advisor for me? Do, you know, and what do I need? And, and the trouble is there are three mysteries to the universe, Ev. One, uh, three mysteries of the universe. Birds to the air, fish to water, and humans to themselves. So you can't do this work on your own as powerfully as you can with a great mentor or guide or with a great community. Hmm. So true. Um, I'm going to quote somebody you know very well. And I want to say, and I want to talk about why I'm quoting. I know what's inside me. I know the power, the beauty, the exuberance, the wow factor. And ac accessing it has been a challenge for a lot of my life, it's frustrating. Knowing who you are and knowing there are walls and valleys that separate you from who you are. I think that was your wife on, after she's opened for uh, another singer standing in front of 1,500, a crowd of 1,500 people in, I believe in Detroit. Um, I don't know what Monique goes through is going through, but I have a son who is a is a really super talented jazz musician. I've mm -hmm. followed him since middle school with master classes with some incredible, incredible teachers. And th to be an artist is is so brutally challenging. And for her to accomplish that, and then that's what she's saying, right? I know what's inside me. I know the power, the beauty, the, the exuberance, the wow factor. Accessing it has been a challenge. And mm. I think to, to the point of talking to the entrepreneurs and the awareness of you need help, you need coaching, you can't do this on your own. I think this is kind of like what, what Monique is talking about, right? You, you've got to have that awareness. That there's stuff inside you, but it doesn't always come out on its own. You, you need the, mm. the awareness that's there and then you seek the help, right? Is that... I mean, I, I mean, I can really relate to what she's saying because with my son, he didn't want to spend his life doing gigs and jazz clubs in, in Manhattan. That's not mm -hmm. the life he wanted for himself. Uh, and it's a compromise that a lot of particularly yeah. jazz musicians have to take because it's a brutal genre in, in the music scene. Um, but I remember when he was applying to college and he said to me, Dad, all these people that I learned with said to me, this is a really tough way to make a living. And there was one bass player, and I forgot his name. He played with every legendary musician, and he told my son. And he said to him, 
if you're going to sit at home, you're a very talented young man. I wish I had your talent. If you're going to sit at home and wait for the phone to ring, newsflash, coaches, same thing for coaches, right? You can't sit home and wait for the phone to ring. But you're talented. If you're going to sit home and wait for the phone to ring, you're going to die of starvation. So if you are a musician, go make music. Go play. Play in a subway. Play on cruise ships. Play in weddings. Pray whatever. Just go do your thing. And when and my son said to me, Dad, there's a very little chance I'm going to be able to make a living doing this. Maybe I should do something else. And I looked at him and I said, Ilan, what does this mean to you? Because I'm not a musician. He said, the saxophone, the jazz, everything. I said, then go be a musician. Don't be like the rest of the world, your father included, who are frustrated and unhappy in, it, in spite of whatever levels of success. Uh, go do what you love, right? Nice. Um, and, nice. And, and so, so there's an important distinction there that you, your, your friends, uh, your, your son's friend or mentor was pointing to. Um, doing what you love, follow your passion, is often said by multimillionaires. Uh, and and following your passion means you can have a passionate life. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll make money from it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I um, th there's the concept I teach my clients when they, especially when they have kids, uh, it, it, which is the idea of skill stacking. Look, if you're a great musician, well, put entrepreneurship on top of that and put public speaking on top of that and see what you can create. Because when you put these overlapping skills on top of one another, then you become very unique. As, as great a jazz musician as you might be, there's a thousand other jazz musicians out there. But a jazz musician who also does public speaking and knows how to build a business, now we're getting very, very small in the number of people who, who are like you. And so, you know, my wife is not just a musician. She's a transformational leader. She uses her music as transformation. And so sometimes she's teaching, sometimes she's coaching, sometimes she's performing. So that's when I'm speaking to young people, like, look at what other skills can you overlay on top of that one skill that you love to have you be really unique in the world. So if, if some of my listeners who, for whatever reason, did not embrace coaching, maybe weren't aware of it, maybe thought of it of something different, um, what advice do you have for someone who's considered coaching? How do they identify someone who can help them? What's a good coach? I mean, how do you know a good coach from an average coach? Because on a website, everybody's great. Yeah, 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 very true. Uh, well, through an experience. So I wrote a book 10 years ago that's been on the top 20 books on coaching for the last 10 years in Amazon uh, called The Prosperous Coach. And it's telling coaches to build a relationship-based business. Uh, if you like doing internet, internet marketing, being online, great, by all means, try it out. But coaching is a people profession. And the way that you sell coaching is by giving people an experience of what you do. So anyone who says they're a great coach, by all means, look at their testimonials on their website and see what they have to say, and then ask for an experience of that. And some people will do that at no charge. And some people might charge a fee for that. But you want someone to give you an experience. So, you know, oh, this feels good or it doesn't feel good. It's just like hiring a personal trainer. Uh, it, it's hard to find a new trainer and then you've got to go and work out with them a handful of times to get a sense of, yeah, this is right for me or this is not right for me. Yeah, you want an experience of that person. Yeah. And, and I think that it's my style, but I know you do this a lot um, in, in our complimentary assessment as you know, the cheesy the way meeting somebody as a potential client. Um, you always say, well, they think they're interviewing me, but I'm actually interviewing them. So mm. The, the lesson I've learned the hard way after 12 years, somebody asked me, what did you learn the most after 12 years? And I said, without a doubt, the, the best thing I've learned is how to choose and select the right client. Because the ones I've wasted my time for the first six, seven years drained me out of energy. I worked hours and hours for them for not enough compensation for sure. So the same thing goes for a coach. If somebody, you sit down with a coach and they prom and they immediately know what you need, and they haven't spent any time getting to know you and, and maybe unlocking what's in that mental prison, then that's probably an indication of somebody who's, who's templated and not intuitive like you and somebody that, nice. that's sympathetic. So, nice. so, question, let, so let me, let me yeah, provoke your ahead. thinking for a second. Let me provoke yes. your thinking for a second. Because you said, uh, yeah, when I'm, when I'm speaking to a potential client, uh, they think they're interviewing me. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm checking out, are you even the right person for me to work with? Uh, well, you've 
thought you've been interviewing me this time? What if you had it the wrong way around? What if the entire time I've been interviewing you? And if that was the case, then what I would want to ask next is, why are you doing this, Ev? What is this for? Oh, and, and behind that, let me get really specific. What's one result you would love your listeners to get as a result of listening to either this episode, or your entire podcast? So the reason to why I'm doing it is because I found that um, other than having the ability to ask a question and connect with people, uh, every one of my guests has, at least as I'm going to steal from you, one insight. If there is one insight that any of my listeners can take away from the different guests that I have that can make a tiny difference in their personal life or in their entrepreneurial business life then I have accomplished my goal. And how do I know it's working? I've committed to not spending one cent promoting my web, my website, my podcast, I'm sorry. I am a Seth Godin mentee. I've followed him for years. I know Seth. Um, I ship it as he calls it. And for me, it's ideas that spread. If people resonate with my style and the people that I'm interviewing and they, they get value out of it, They'll tell their friends and it's working because now people are pitching me to be on my podcast. I'm really a, an unknown entity. So the answer to your question is back to the one insight. If there's one thing any of my listeners will walk away with that will make a difference in their personal or professional life, I've accomplished my goal because that's really why I'm doing it. And what's, what's your goal? What? You, you said twice now, then I'll have accomplished my goal. But you haven't specified what's the goal to, to, Why you doing to, to make a difference in the lives of entrepreneurs, because I've directed my career since coming into the U.S. as an immigrant to work in the small business world. And I know how much they need coaching on one hand, but also be able to open their mind and learn from other people. Entrepreneurship is a roller coaster of anxiety. You know, it, I know it. I work with business owners all the time. And if they can take in half an hour or an hour. And walk away with one nugget. My goal is to make it to make a difference, really, to anybody else. So what's interesting about what you said from one immigrant to another is that when you're an immigrant, you leave your baggage behind. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do as great coaches. We help people, people put their baggage behind them. And, and the trouble is you can't see your own baggage. You don't realize that that voice in your head that's telling you, uh, constantly berating you, it's not your voice. It's the voice of your father. And actually, he didn't really sound like that when you were a kid, but you just took that on. And, and that voice in your head that says, you can't do this, or you should do that, they're not who you are. And great, mm -hmm. great coaches can reflect back who you are. So I love knowing that you're an immigrant just like me. And I'm a, I come from a family of immigrants um, in the UK too. My, my grandparents didn't even come from the UK. They came from Eastern Europe. I know what it means to help someone put their baggage down. And that's why I do what I do. Because when you can help people get clearer in their thinking, all sorts of possibilities open up that they couldn't see a moment before. Yeah, and, and look, when, when, my client, when a client tells a, a, a referring person that I referred him to said, I, I have to tell you, and I'm using my name, but it applies to good coaches. He literally changed my life. Right. Um, I, there's no, there's not an amount of of money that somebody can pay me to get that result. This is what I'm driven by. That's why I left the corporate career to do this. And the initial years, as you know, Rich, were brutal. Coaching is a is a tough concept for a lot of people because they don't think they need the help. And if I pay you, how fast do I see results? We know all the stories. It, it was a really, really long road. But I wanted you on here for people to understand that it's beyond it's not a commodity it, it is it is really deeply intimate and and has incredible impact on people that embrace it and as we said open their mind to what's coming with the right person um and i mean i've listened to you for six years i listen to everything you do i steal from you little things here and there they do make a difference um and I, I can I tell I've never been interviewed before by someone who's had so many of my quotes written down. Uh, I, I love that you've done that research and even my wife's quotes. Uh, that I was mean, interesting. I, 
Yeah, I mean, I do hours of research, but it was easy for me because, again, I'm not bragging because you know that I admire you. Um, I listen to you. I highlight things. I have a whole folder called Rich Litvin, um, and I use some of your work because because it's brilliant. So um, last question, Rich. If you had a billboard in Times Square, hmm. what would that say? It would have the title of the book I'm writing with my nine-year-old son. It would say, a little scary is good. Perfect. Perfect. So again, I'm humbled and thankful for you taking the time. Uh, good luck with your son. Uh, he'll get there. You openly share everything he's going through. And it's, it's so it's personal to me. I had similar challenges with one of my kids. But you know what? We look back, they'll overcome it especially with parents like you. Thanks, man. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. To Thank find you. Rich, you'll find Rich. If you type Rich Litvin, you'll find Rich. It'll be all be in my show notes. Um, thanks again. Zev, for, for yeah. any of your um, listeners who are, um, yeah, richlitvin.com will take you to my website, richlitvin.com forward slash scorecard. If you're a coach or you're a business owner, entrepreneur who's looking to move into coaching, the scorecard will give you an assessment of, of how to grow as a coach. Perfect. And it, I'll put all of it in the show notes. Thanks again, Rich. It's a pleasure. Shalom. Shalom.